uh, the 28th chapter, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. God. Amen. Please be seated. So it's the first Sunday after Pentecost. We're gearing up for Vacation Bible School, which starts later this evening. Summer vacations are on the horizon. Some have uh, already begun, I think it's fair to say. And all of that makes today Trinity Sunday. Not really all of that. Uh, It's not all of that that makes it Trinity Sunday. It's just the first part, really. Uh, Every year, after we celebrate Pentecost... And the Holy Spirit being poured out into the world, we celebrate Trinity Sunday. And when you think about it, it makes total sense. Because after celebrating and talking about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's presence in our life and in our world, it only makes sense to celebrate and talk about the Trinity. All of God's uh, self. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God three in one. And so Trinity Sunday always follows after Pentecost, and where Pentecost is one of the most important days in the Christian year. Because of all that it means to us that the Holy Spirit is present with us, that the Holy Spirit bears God's presence to us, that the Holy Spirit guides us and comforts us and advocates advocates for us. Where Pentecost is one of the most important days in the Christian year for all of those reasons, Trinity Sunday may give us, as believers in the way, the opportunity and reminder we need to be able to bear witness to one of the most important realities about the God that we worship in this day and age. Trinity Sunday provides us with an opportunity and a reminder about who God is, about how God is, an important reality about what God does that we need to bear witness to in this day and in this age. You see, division is antithetical to who God is. Division is counter to God everything that God is and is about. It is the opposite of God's life and ministry and mission and intention for creation. God's Trinitarian nature, that God is Trinity, that God is three in one, God's Trinitarian nature is God's life, God's being, It's who God is, because God is. And as God is, God is three persons in, with, and of one substance, one being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is how God is and how God is one, three in one. The doctrine of the Trinity is not an easy doctrine to grasp. Uh, It is a complicated um, reality for us as human beings. We create other metaphors for it. We create other ways of explaining it. We create other ways of thinking about it, ways that are more rational to us, ways that make more sense, ways that help us to understand just a little bit bit of a glimpse of what the Trinity really means and what it's really trying to tell us. But... At its core, at its core, it is that God is three in one. Three persons with one substance, one being. And we have to live with that mystery to a certain extent. 
God is three in one. And the Trinitarian God that we serve, you see, shows us how each person in the Trinity, this substance of who God is, bears all of them into the world so that God is always present and always with us. The Trinity is the way that God is so that God can always be with us. The way God has designed for God to be. So God can always be with us. You see, the Trinitarian God that we serve has been seeking to include creation in God's life since the beginning. It's what we heard in that passage from Genesis. That is why God created us and everything to include all of it in God's life, to have us be a part of God's being, God's world. And when we corrupted ourselves and all of creation with us, we did that. We corrupted ourselves and all of creation with us, this order that God created, this way for all of creation to be with God, this reality that God wanted all of us to be a part of God's life. When we corrupted that and all of creation with us, and that word, by the way, for that corruption is sin, And Adam and Eve weren't the only ones of us to do it. We continue to sin. And we continue to corrupt all of creation through our sinfulness, to divide ourselves from God and from creation. That's been uh, pretty painfully apparent to me over the last couple of weeks as we have divided ourselves from our environment and created order out of our sinfulness. We continue to do that, to have our corruption and sinfulness impact God's good creation. And despite our corruption, despite our sinfulness, God continues and will always continue to seek ways to bring us back into God's life, to pull us back in, to unite us with God once again. But over and over again, we choose division. We choose to be divided from God and from one another, from all of creation, deciding it's easier to do what we want than to be constrained by having to live with God and with people different from us. We divide and divide and divide from creation, from other human beings, and from God. And still God seeks us out. Still God looks and looks throughout all of Scripture for ways to unite us once again with Him, to pull us back into God's life as God is, into God's very being. To God's love and grace and mercy, God continued to seek us until finally God sent God's own child, a son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, to be God with us, Emmanuel, to live with us and walk with us, to teach us, to lead us, to die for us, and to be raised to new life for us opening wide the door into God's house so that all of creation, all of humanity, might one day be brought into unity with one another and with God. 
recreating, creating anew the creation that God intended, trying to restore and redeem all that we had corrupted and broken, all that we have continued to corrupt and break and wound, to try and unite us once again with one another, with all of creation and with God. Christ came to open wide the doors into God's very life and being so that we could be with God as God is with us and as God was with us walking with us. And when Christ had ascended, God even sent God's Holy Spirit to be with us, to point us to that door, to draw us to Christ, to encourage us to be a part of God's life to be in unity with God and one another and all of creation. The Holy Spirit that we celebrated last week is here to draw us, to make sure that even though we didn't get to walk with Christ, even though we didn't get to hear his words while he was on earth, that we can still have a relationship, that we can still experience Christ as the way, as the gate as the truth, as the life, so that we can still know life in unity with God. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, and yet, early on with God's church, something strange happens. We know it happens And happened back then because the apostles Paul and Peter and James tell us it happened in their letters. The church began to divide itself. As believers in Jesus Christ, the church began to be divided. Jews and Greeks, haves and have-nots, Apollos' disciples and Paul's disciples and Peter's disciples, male and female, slave and free, they divided themselves. And the apostles called them to account, reminded them of the unity that they shared in Christ, tried to encourage them to hang on to it, to hold on to it, to be bound together by the Holy Spirit that draws them to Christ the way that all creation, that all humanity, that all the world is supposed to come to unity in God. But that sin... That corruption, that division runs deep in us. And we continued to divide ourselves, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, Protestant and Catholic, Methodist and Church of England, Methodist Episcopal Church South and Methodist Episcopal Church, conservative and liberal, Orthodox and reconciling. each camp deciding who's right and who's wrong. We divided. There's a reason that those letters from the apostles were made part of our scripture. They continue to call us to account for our division. Hear from Paul again from his farewell address to the Corinthians in his second letter. He had to write to them twice. They didn't get it the first time. Both letters are about the ways they divide themselves, by the way. Here again, this is Paul according to Rhett. Finally, loved ones... Hear what I'm telling you and change your heart and life. Put things in order. But remember that when God puts things in order, 
Unity is God's organizing principle. So if your ordering divides, excludes, condemns, or ostracizes, chances are it isn't an ordering God approves of. Put things in order. Be in harmony with one another. Be in harmony as the body of Christ. Be in harmony as the church. Now, harmony isn't about singing the same note, correct? Harmony is not about singing the same note. If we sing the same note, we're monotone. Harmony is about all of us sharing the tune, singing it together in the way that works for each voice and for the good of the sound of the whole group and the song. The song we sing as the church is God's song, taught to us over the ages, a song of unity, a song that's meant to be sung in a way that honors each of our voices, each of our gifts, each of our ways of knowing and relating to the divine, each of our ways of being disciples, so that when we sing it together as a church, the song that issues forth from these walls, the song that issues forth from our life, draws people into Christ, lets people know of the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, of the way that he is the way that the door is opened wide, so so that all can come and find unity in God's life, in God's mission, in God's will. We're supposed to have harmony with one another, not sing the same note, not all have the same part, not all believe the song should be sung the same way, but we sing together anyway to find harmony. Now, harmony can be ruined by someone who refuses to sing because their voice is missing and by someone who obstinately sings over everyone else so that all other notes are drowned out. Harmony is ruined either way. We are called to be in harmony with one another and live in peace. Live in peace. And this goes beyond just the way that we live with one another in the church. We are called to live in peace. And this is over and against the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, enforced by soldiers wielding weapons for the government by governors handing down floggings and crucifixions to make examples of people so others won't step out of line. It's not a peace won through a war of words with the one who gets in the most or last word getting to set the terms. This is God's peace born from the assurance that God is God and we are not. The assurance that we are loved unconditionally and so must love unconditionally. God's peace born from the knowledge that we can call to account only those by whom we are willing to be called to account. And born by the realization that we make peace by beating our own swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks long before we get proof that anyone else has done the same. Live in peace. And if we do these things, Paul says, if we put things in order, if we are in harmony with each other and live in peace, the God of love and peace will be with us. And just in case we are unwilling to do what Paul recommends at the end of his second letter to the Corinthian church, Paul prays for us in spite of us the grace of Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
I find that it is both a blessing and an indictment that Paul prays on us. Because when we are aware of God, the God three in one who is with us, because God has promised to be with us. When we are aware of the God three in one who is with us, when we can sense the unified and graceful loving communion of the divine in our midst, we can do no other than put things in God's united order, be in harmony with one another, and live in peace. So as Paul prays this blessing on us, knowing that we're probably unwilling to put things in order on our own, knowing that we're probably unwilling to be in harmony with those with which we with whom we disagree vehemently, knowing that we are unwilling to beat our swords into plowshares, knowing that we're unwilling to give up the war and look for peace, knowing all that, Paul prays for us anyway. That the God who calls us to unity and harmony and peace be with us. That we be aware of God's presence. And that we can do no other in spite of ourselves. God be with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.